Good morning, everyone. It's so lovely to have you here. Thank you all so, so much for taking the time. I'm not quite sure what happened with that screen share there. I'm not sure if that video was being shared. So if I was warming up the screen for like a minute and a half there, my apologies. Uh, anyway, let's get going. <laughs> oh, thank you, Kelsey. That's really reassuring to know that you can see the video. Well, that was great. Cool. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all so, so much for being here. Uh, it's so lovely uh, to have you along. Uh, it's been two weeks since I've presented one of these sessions and it's so lovely to be back. Um, just seeing those uh, those chat messages come through once again, it's honestly every time uh, it just fills me up. It really fills me up. So thank you all so much. Uh, do keep popping in that chat feature where you're watching from uh, and don't forget to switch those messages to everyone uh, so we can see. I can see people from Solihull, uh, Cambridge, Dublin, Kuala Lumpur, Ch uh, Cheltenham, Paris, uh, Kent, St Andrews. Uh, amazing. It's so, so wicked every time. So there's two challenges for you this morning and those of you who are regular viewers into today's sessions uh, will know all about these two sessions. You could probably recount them yourselves at this stage. So the first challenge uh, is all about keeping that chat feature buzzing throughout the duration of today's session. Bryony, Rachel and I will be doing our best to entertain you, to enthrall you, to fill your minds with knowledge that you didn't necessarily have before. But really, the really, really important part of all of this is every one of you also contributing and making this session special. Um, it's a really, really important part of this session uh, that every one of us comes and, and sort of engages. So if I could ask one thing from every one of you, it would be to continue engaging as you are right now, saying hello, looking after each other and uh, just having a nice time. Secondly, uh, the, the second thing I'd really, really appreciate is uh, a share on social media, wherever it may be, uh, whether it's your LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram or whatever, with your biggest takeaway from today's session. As I say, Bryony, Rachel and I will be doing our best to uh, give you new information. So if there's a moment which sort of lights up and, and takes you uh, into a light bulb moment, then uh, please share it online. It's important because it's how we start a conversation between the community, but it's also how we grow the community. Like all of everything that we do to bring in lovely people just like you watching in today is all about word of mouth. So it's really, really important that we take the time to, to share if you want to, indeed. And one to Catherine and Carl uh, in Lebury and Norwich and Sophie in Leamington. Wicked. Um, so if those two challenges are lodged in your brain, the first about keeping that chat feature going and then the second about... Uh, sharing on social media after today's session, then let's get going. And we have Bryony and Rachel, uh, Bryony Thomas and Rachel Wheatless, Wheatley today, the mean team behind Watertight Marketing. Watertight Marketing is an excellent book, uh, literally one of the best marketing books I've ever read, and uh, a community geared to helping folks uh, just like you watching today. Uh, we've got a lot of crossover in, in between the people that we try to help. And that's why I know that today's session is really going to be nailed into our community. This is actually Bryony's second time speaking at the marketing meetup. And my abiding memory from that thing is, is uh, three times. The first was her sheer professionalism. The second was the enthusiastic response from the community afterwards. And I shared that, that uh, text that I got after the first session yesterday, where someone, Baz, my friend Baz, just texted me and said, that was the best webinar ever. And then the third... Um, was thinking that bloody hell, Bryony has a model for everything. So the fact that she's bringing Rachel along today as well, uh, I know that we've got twice the trouble, but um, you know, in the best possible way, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Today we'll function as a presentation and then a Q&A. We've got about 20, 25 minutes of a presentation and then time for Q&A afterwards. So do drop your questions into the uh, into the Q&A feature, which is found down below. You wiggle your mouse, you find the Q&A feature and you're heading there, uh, that's where you'll find the Q&A feature and I'll be taking questions uh, and posing them to, to Bryony and Rachel after today's presentation. So please do get them in. As I say, it's a really important part of today's session that you'll get involved. Before we get going, there's one big thank you for me to do, and that's to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, who are Attest. Attest are a new sponsor of the Marketing Meetup, but one I am very, very grateful for. And the reason I'm grateful for them is because I think they provide genuine value to a community like ours. Uh, 
Uh, Attest are a customer research platform or market research platform that help you get responses to your survey super quick, um, but also super targeted on, on demographics that enable you to really nail down on the folks that you want to reach rather than just, you know, sort of putting something on a Facebook group and, and hoping that someone responds to, you know, your survey monkey. Um, with that in mind, Attest are doing a really great thing at the moment, which is they're offering the community a free survey with 100 respondents, um, which I'll link in the post uh, session uh, email with, with the links and the recording. Um, and it will enable you to have a free survey with 100 respondents uh, asking any questions that you like, uh, targeting who you like. It's a really great deal, but also gives you an opportunity to taste out the platform. We're big fans of them, so a big thank you to a test. Um, also, a big, big thank you to Content Square, Hrefs, Impression, Content Cal, Redgate, Cambridge Martin College, Brand Recruitment, Gravity Global, and Third Light. I'll speak about each of those on rotation as, as the rest of the season goes on. So, with all of that said, that is my introduction done. Um, and so, Bryony, um, thank you so much for being here, and Rachel as well. Uh, but Bryony, I think you're first, so it's over to you. I am. Thank you, Joe. Fantastic to be here. Um, I'm Bryony Thomas from Watertight Business Thinking, and I'm joined today by my business partner, Rachel Wheatley. Um, between us, we have over 50 years of marketing experience, um, and so we hope to bring, bring some of that to you today. This session is about um, making sure that your board or your boss are on side with marketing. And the shorthand for that is how to convert a marketing cynic. And so one of the things that I've done over the last, um, last decade or so is to present um, marketing sessions for chief exec and MD groups. And I always kick off a session with, with the same thing. And I invite the room to choose either a red pen or a green pen and tell me either something they hate or something they love about marketing. And I've collected up the words over time. And here are some words. So on the red side, the sorts of words that chief execs of um, small businesses, successful small businesses, our market is that 10 to 20 million sort of turnover. So these are the, the words they've come up with. So on the left hand side here in the red are the sorts of things we've got people saying. And it's normally more than half of the room that choose the red pen. Overwhelming, slow, manipulative, expensive. Yes, many of them are finance directors. Um, hype, exhausting, fluffy. And then there will be a group in the room, usually around 30 to 40 percent, who will reach for the green pen. And the green pen will say almost exactly the opposite. So for every you know, uh, negative word there in the red, we've almost got an equal and opposite green word for someone for whom marketing is a, is a driver in their business. And they see it as sustainable, proven, trustworthy, clear, tangible. And these are the sorts of um, differences that I encounter all the time. I tend to find that we, you either have cynics or converts. And what we as watertight business thinking aim to do when we go into these businesses and we do a marketing centered business transformation is often to take people on a journey of moving from cynic to convert. And I'm going to show you some of the key things that we do to do that. I'm going to invite you to explore a, a key metaphor, um, I, 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 more than one. Anyone who knows me will know that I'm a bit of a mixed metaphor person, so I'll bring you plenty. I've definitely got two. I might bring some more. Let's see how we get on. Um, and in order to equip you to have the sorts of conversations that will bring non-marketers with you on this journey from cynic to convert. <clears throat> so have a think, um, what sort of words do you think the people that you would like to convince might um, put on the board? Would they be reaching for a red pen or a green pen? Have a think about it. Now, this is a, a piece of research and I was trying to, I was trying to find it um, before we got started. I was trying to find my source for this and I, I, I couldn't. Um, so I will, I will have another look and see if I can dig it out. It's research um, that I remember putting together in 2019. And there are over 4.2 um, 4 million SMEs in that 2 to 20 million turnover mark. And there was a particular survey that we found that 79% said that their biggest problem was attracting and retaining customers. 
which is marketing, right? So 80% nearly of the businesses that are in that under 20 million sort of turnover mark say that marketing is their biggest problem. Now, when we've talked to our, um, the MDs and CEOs of the clients that we work with, there are particular characters that emerge in terms of their cynicism about marketing. And I've pulled out these four. These are clients of um, what's type business thinking. We've worked with all of these organizations on uh, marketing transformation processes. And they characterize different types of cynicism. So we have Karen Meager here, who is the ethical objector. In all honesty, most of what I've read about marketing made me see it as an icky world, odd with my values. So she's the person who sees it as manipulation. Marketing equals manipulation. I don't want to do that. It's, ooh. Then we have Dave James. Dave James is show me the line from marketing to sales results. I cannot see cause and effect between the two. And it looks like a waste of money. So um, Dave is show me the money. Then we have Dave Carr. Dave Carr is um, the, the tech technologist or the, the crazy inventor. Um, so Dave is uh, the founder of his business. And every time they wanted to create more business, he'd go and make the product better. Because obviously, when you add more bells and whistles to your widget, it sells more, right? Um, and so Dave was the classic, well, my product should sell itself. It's amazing. Uh, so we, there are a number of those. And then Patrick Nash was, marketing's really fluffy. Mar uh, Patrick was, I want a system. I want a proven process. And marketing is such a dark art. I don't want hacks and tricks and some guru giving me their, uh, you know, their, their kind of swipe file. I want to actually understand how this works. So these are classic characters that we find. The ethical objector, the show me the money, the my product will sell itself, let me make it a bit better. And hang on a sec how does this work? Show me the system. So have a think about the sort of characters that you see, but we see these all of the time. Now, one of the key reasons that, um, that I see that uh, marketing is misunderstood by non-marketers is because what they see of marketing gets interpreted as marketing. So when you talk to a non-marketer and you say, what is marketing? They'll generally come up with one of two answers in various different words. They will either say marketing is lead generation, go and get me some inbound leads, or it's the coloring in. So I've, I've, I've finished my product, I know exactly who it's for. Can you just make it a bit prettier, please? Um, we have this non-marketers look out to the world and they see other people's lead generation and brand, and they think that is marketing. And if what you see of marketing is what you see as marketing, what tends to happen is you create this stuff without any substance. So if you go straight to lead generation and colouring in without the underpinning principles, you will create marketing that is a bit meh, you know, it's just rubbish, has no substance. And so what I'd like to take you through today is a core framework. As Joe says, I've got a framework for everything. This is in chapter two and chapter 11 of the second edition. It is talked about in the first edition, but it's very much updated in the second edition. So these are the four flow foundations. And what I've done here is a proportional split around what I think a marketer in a, in a successful smaller business, because that's our, our audience, although I'm sure it's true in larger organi organizations as well, should be spending their energy. So we have four areas. We have the right work, which um, we're going to go on to define. So making sure that you're, you're, who you're selling to and what you're selling is appropriate and keeps you nourished. The balanced routine, what you're going to do with them, baseline rhythm, keeping it all happening and maintaining momentum, which is your vision. And we're going to go through and define some of these. The key thing about um, really good marketing is that marketing answers key questions. The job of a marketer and one of the key things you need to do in converting a cynic is to make sure that you're showing them the questions that need to be answered rather than simply showing them, here's what I want you to do. You need to take people on that, that kind of intellectual journey. So the questions here, the right work, so making sure you've got the right clients um, in your organization and you're putting your marketing in the right place, is to whom are you offering what? key question that a marketer needs to answer before they can do any lead generation or colouring in. 
Then we have, how are you going to support those people to that destination? So what is the journey? What are the steps in the process? Which was very much what I spent the last session looking at. And I know that Joe can link you to the recording of that session. So to whom are you offering what? How are you going to support that? And then when you've made your plan, how often, when are you going to show up with those tools? And then critically, why are you doing it? And without that why, you will struggle to find anything of substance. And so what this organises is these four foundations that main, maintain flow through an organisation, and that's energetic flow and sales flow. And Rachel's now going to run through defining each of those. And we invite you to um, come with us on a little metaphorical journey because, you know, storytelling is important, even for those cynics. Over to you, Rachel. OK, thank you very much, Bryony. Bear with me, Caller. Um, so I am going to talk about um, the Flow Foundations in a bit more detail. So I think we can probably all agree that marketing is about supporting healthy sales growth. That growth. Um, and because we like a good analogy here, Bryony mentioned that earlier, I'm going to relate uh, marketing to health and fitness. So using that analogy, the right work here is about having a nutritious diet. So you're looking for clients that and work that sustain you and energize you. So if you're mainly eating chips or crisps, I'm sure that's not like any of us here, uh, those easy win clients, they won't nourish your business. They won't motivate you or your staff. So you want clients that build you up. You're looking for a healthy client's mix, uh, and it's, that is one that serves both purpose and profit. So yes, it brings you in money. Yes, it brings in you in revenue. Of course, you need that to pay the bills, but it also talks to your purpose and is therefore energizing. So we have a core framework. Of course we do. It's the purpose profit matrix. It's in chapter 11 of the book. Um, and it helps you determine what criteria to use to identify those right healthy clients that do have a balance of both purpose and profit. So let's say you, say you have a healthy client mix, um, maybe a good 80% of nutritious clients uh, that motivate you and you pay you well. The next flow foundation that you look at is the balance routine. And this is a bit like having a personal trainer. So if you've ever been to a personal trainer, what they do is they take time to understand you, where you are in your fitness and what, what your goals are. And that's exactly the same with marketing. So a, mar a good marketing fitness plan is one where you have um, an effective tool and technique for every step. So different people's, different businesses' fitness plans will be completely different. Yours will be different to mine. And um, each business has a different mix of marketing tools and techniques that will serve as that fitness plan. So you might be you might come into a business and find that they're more at the couch to 5K end of fitness, or you might be going to for Olympic gold or somewhere in between. So the fitness routine will be different depending on how fit you are to begin with and what your marketing goals are. So a balanced marketing fitness plan is one where you have that effective tool or technique mapped to each step of the sales journey. So that's from the time that the prospect is first aware of you and all the way through to when, they're, uh, when they say yes and beyond when they're a loyal and very happy customer. So all of those stages need support from marketing. We often find we talk to businesses and that they might actually be mainly focused on one area of marketing for one reason or another. And it's the equivalent of a bodybuilder who's who spent a lot of time and energy building up their upper, upper body and strength. They've got massive muscles, but they've got tiny legs. So if you ask them to 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 run 100 yards or a marathon, they couldn't do it. So we're looking here for all round fitness, a routine that supports customers all the way through their buying journey. So remember that statistic that Bryony mentioned earlier, the 79% of um, SMEs who say their main challenge is attracting and keeping customers. So if your marketing is only focusing on attracting customers, if that's what you're asked to do, it's the marketing equivalent of a bodybuilder. So say you have a, a healthy diet of clients, you've got a balanced fitness plan. The third flow foundation is the baseline rhythm. So 
This is doing enough of this stuff, often enough, to make a difference. So we all know how common it is to start going to the gym in January and by March it's maybe petered out a bit. I know that's happened to me. Um, it's up to us in marketing to understand what that rhythm needs to be. So your dashboard, your metrics, how you resource your marketing, your budgeting all need to reflect a commitment to marketing. And that commitment uh, is delivered at a pace that matches your market. So if they go fast, you match that with your marketing. If they go slow and it takes a bit longer to get a sale, then your marketing actually needs to reflect that. And finally, we have the why, which is actually the, um, uh, you know, really important flow foundation. It's actually the, sometimes the one that we start with with businesses. So you've got a healthy client uh, uh, diet of clients. You've got a balanced routine that match, matches your goals. You've got that right drumbeat to engage your prospects. The final flow foundation that I'm going to talk about is maintaining momentum. So that is only possible if you know where you're going, the direction of travel. So often we work with clients and their plan, you look at their plan and it's all about financial goals. It's we want to reach this many million pounds in, in five years time. Um, we find less frequently there's a story and a vision behind those goals. And you need both because you need the story and the vision that motivates you and engages staff. That's why they buy in. Um, and they can work collaboratively towards that. But they also need those milestones. They know where they are, and you can measure some kind of pro pro progress. So as a marketer, um, one of our jobs is actually to bring those things together, the vision, the values, the plan, and communicate those throughout the organization um, into a compelling business vision that is then translated into a into a clear plan. So there's a story that can be shared, there's financial, um, but other metrics as well that show where you've got to and that you're going in the right direction. So these are the elements that underpin successful marketing. Um, and they're the elements that a marketing team, a um, marketing department, marketing lead will need to be involved in to support a growing business. So what Watertight Marketing does, what you do as your marketing professional in your business is to use a whole set of strategic thinking tools that ask and answer the right questions to make sure that all of those book boxes that are there on the slide there are ticked. What I love about this slide is that it shows why marketing is central to successful business. So the vast majority of questions that you would ask an answer as strategic marketers to tick off those boxes would form the basis of a business plan, making the direct link between that and strategic marketing. This is the point at which we often find that the penny drops for those cynical non-marketers on the board. And it helps them to realize that marketing is not just about coloring in or lead generation. They can see, they can understand how it overlaps and forms the basis of a business plan. So have a think about those four areas. So you, marketing, um, it will help you position yourself and your team more strategically when you use the, uh, they're used as the foundations for your marketing because you can point to them, people can see and understand them and understand what your contribution is. So if you were to um, see those four foundations as four legs of a table, um, watch out for another analogy, metaphor, um, and imagine if uh, those four legs were not at the same height. So we have a test, we'll point you to it later. Um, we have a test that scores those flow foundation. It asks you 40 questions um, and it comes out with a percentage score for each of those flow foundations. So imagine that it comes out a bit like that, this on your slide. So they're not the same height. Um, it's a bit like doing an exercise on a wobble board. I don't know if you've ever done it. I've tried it recently and I couldn't do it. It's hard work. It's very difficult to stand on it and keep your balance. Um, and it's certainly harder than it needs to be. So first of all, we suggest, we recommend people are aiming for a stable table where all of their legs are the same height. Um, and it's up to marketing to understand how well supported each of those different areas are and help make them stable. Um, 
before you determine how tall they are. So the shorter they are, the slower your growth. The taller they are, the faster you, the, the growth will be. So you're going to want to split it in two. So on the left, we have the uh, right work and maintaining momentum foundations, and they're the strategic elements of marketing. On the right, you've got the operational side. That's the balanced routine and the baseline rhythm. So the test helps you, as I mentioned, helps you determine the percentage of those tables. Um, and sometimes what we see is this, it's one extreme. So we've got the strategic, which is high, the operational side, which is low. Um, and it's a typical C shape. And we see this a lot in businesses. So it's pretty good business. They've got a vision in place. They know who their good clients are. But the operational side is not so good. It's hard work. It's supported by um, pedal power. Um, people power. Often it's businesses that have a sales team in place, but the marketing is not so developed um, and it's hard work for them. So they don't have the systems or processes in place that will make that table more stable and make life much easier for them. Equally, we see businesses at the opposite end where the marketing is excellent, um, but there's not much substance or energy in the vision or plan. They haven't, the board hasn't done the work that they need to do to create that um, solid base to the business, the inspiring story on which great marketing can, can shine a light. So looking your, so what you're looking to do is stabilize those legs. And once you do the test, if the uh, legs are uh, low, red, then your growth will be slow. If they're amber, then your growth will be medium. Um, and if they're green, then you'll have high growth. So interestingly, we sometimes talk to businesses who really want quick growth. They want that kind of hockey stick. They say, we want to double in a few years and then we want to double again in another few years. You can't grow that fast unless your table is stable and all your legs are green. You just can't do it. So when you do the test, answer it intuitively. Don't spend too much time thinking about it and do invite other people in your business to do it as well, because it's always interesting to see your colleagues, your boss, your MD's perception of marketing. Um, and so the test really is a really good way of finding out how marketing is perceived in your business. So just to show you an example, this is a cohort analysis of a client that we've been working with. They're called Enviro. Um, they're a, a cleaning and hygiene business. And the MD, this picture there of Brian, he's the MD. And we asked their leadership team to, to do the test. Um, they each individually answered the 40 questions and we brought together the data which gave us this cohort analysis. Um, and I just want to point out a few things from this analysis. Firstly, there is the range. And you'll see that actually individuals within the SLT, the senior leadership team answered quite differently. So at one end, you've got uh, one red and, and you've got a few greens and obviously there's a, a middle bit, uh, quite a few people who answered and amber. So the perception of marketing and the range of opinion was really quite varied. Um, we can analyze it uh, um, with using other filters as well. So how long individuals have been in the business um, and which department they sit in and how that changes the data. So this is just the snapshot of the average overall. Um, it shows you where your champions sit. So people who view marketing very positively and think that we're doing a good job. Equally, it shows where your critics sit, and they're both important. If you want to really improve what you do and step things up, then talk to your critics, because it will help you do that. Um, if you need a champion, and if you need some support and you need some allies, then get, talk, to your, um, talk to your champions. So we, um, across this, when we work with clients, we add another perspective, uh, which is often um, uh, more of a cynic, more of a critic. Um, and it usually serves to lower the average score. Um, sometimes that can be because their marketing capability or knowledge as an organization is low um, and Enviro's was low. Um, sometimes it's because they might not understand really what marketing is and they perceive it to be uh, being more effective than it actually is. So 
what we suggest is, and the, and the value of this test and looking at the four flow foundations is that it helps you to structure the conversation with, you, uh, with your board and your colleagues about how you as a marketing lead can contribute and add value. So in an ideal world, you would get your board on board with those strategic elements to get them to a common understanding of the right work, the proposition, the business plan, the vision, the values, goals. Um, and you might do that for a whole organization engagement like we do, or you might run a workshop where you facilitate the conversation, you introduce these concepts and you facilitate that discussion so that you get to that common understanding of what marketing is and how it can contribute. So then you might um, bring, first of all, so the board gets you to this bit here, engaging with them gets you here. Then you might bring on a senior marketer or strategist if you haven't got one. And they are the bridge between the board and the strategic elements and the operational elements. Um, uh, you might already have that bridge, it might be you. Um, and then you build the operations, which is your people, your team, the resources, um, all of the people who are getting marketing out into the world and doing all of those marketing activities. Sometimes we see it done all the, uh, the other way around. So a business that might be new to marketing builds it from the bottom up. So they get their marketing doer first um, and, uh, and before they realize that actually they might need someone with a bit more wisdom, a bit more seniority, a bit more experience to actually mentor and, and help them structure and build the marketing operation. Um, so if you're in that position where um, you're, you're being asked to, um, to, to be that bridge, might not necessarily have the experience or you're putting your pigeonholes in the operational space, then you might want to lobby for someone to kind of mentor you or coach you to help you bridge that. Um, if, the, if there's a senior marketer, if you're that senior marketer in place and you're struggling to get your board to see marketing, there is more than colouring in or lead gen, then there is a job for you to do. So ideally, in an ideal world, you get the board on board first because it makes life easier for you. And it means you get the support that marketing deserves. So I think I am, uh, well, this is the report actually. Here's the link there, watersitemarketing.com forward slash test. Um, do invite you and, and do invite your MD and bosses and even colleagues to do it as well. And back to Bryony. Thanks, Rachel. So we really invite you to explore using a few metaphors and analogies with your with your um, cynics. So identify those cynics and what type they are and and play with some of these thoughts. The key thing is to help people to uh, we find it really um, that slide that uh, that Joe told you to screen grab. Um, that was uh, if you can say to somebody, say the question you're asking me that sits in this box then you're helping them to see how it all fits together. And you're helping them to see why you can't just do social. I saw that. You can't just do social without knowing who you're talking to, what it, what destination you're trying to get them to and why. Because that's, you know, you can press all the buttons, but what are you going to say and to whom and how often? So by having these boxes in people's minds and in your plan and in the way that you organise things, you're able to orient the question you're being asked into the framework so that you can say, the reason I can't answer you is because sequentially we need to reverse a bit. And you're helping people to understand how they need to do their bit to, uh, to contribute. So the test that's um, available on our site is just a 10 minute test. Um, and you can just answer it yourself quietly if you wish to, or as Rachel says, invite people from around your organization to do it. Answer it really um, intuitively, not to 10, takes about 10 minutes, don't agonize over it. Um, and that will send to you a report in which that screen grab that you all took, the projects are listed and defined in that report. So you can grab those there. So in order to convert a cynic, first of all, you have to identify that. Then you have to understand which of the boxes they think marketing sits in, broaden their understanding so that they can see all of those boxes and understand how the questions link together and always orient what you're suggesting, what you're talking about, 
into that so that they can see how it fits together. It's so important to get people to um, anchor what they're doing at, through these lenses so that you can understand the context of what's being asked. Now, we're very happy to take some questions. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. And the other thing I have for you, if you're interested, um, and you can tell me which of these things you want to do, we can just answer your questions on what we've just gone through, or, and, we could take you through the 16 things that we think absolutely kill the credibility of a marketer in, you know, in, in, in kind of one fell swoop. We put together a, um, a list, and this was, I, I used to tutor the Charleston Institute of Marketing Diploma, and I remember somebody coming in and saying, well, I said, well, why are you doing, why are you doing this course? Well, I want to sound like a marketer. And I go, whoa, now, you don't want to sound like a marketer. That's the last thing you want to sound like. If you sound like a marketer, no one's going to take you seriously. Um, and so one of the things that I encourage all marketers to do is, as you would with your audience, you adopt the language of the people that you're trying to communicate with. And if you are converting a cynic, the last thing you want to sound like is a marketer. And so I encourage you to use the language of the people that you're looking to convince. So um, what I would like to do is I'm going to put up a poll and you can tell me which of these you'd like me to define and talk about. So I'm going to put um, four up on the screen. Would you like to know about buzzword bingo? meaningless metrics, the relay race, or cost budgeting. The, and I can, I can link you to where I've got a definition of all of these um, credibility killers because they are literally the things that you are doing to yourself um, to undermine your own credibility. So have a look, um, tell me what you want us to talk about and, and we'll do that and then we can answer a few questions as well. Over in chat, I have put the link to the test. It's watertightmarketing.com forward slash test. I have also put, um, I'm going to put a link now to a blog post on all 16 of these credibility killers if we're not going to cover them all today. Okay, I'm going to let a few more of you vote. Have a look, we've got 72% of you have voted. Give you a couple more moments. Whilst they're voting, Joe, any key comments or questions that have come through? Just a bunch of validation and sharing of experiences, actually. It was really nice, mm. actually, just to see folks uh, supporting one another, you know, and, and I think this is something a lot of folks will struggle with or relate to. Um, so actually, <laughs> as, as much as it, it's been wonderful to see this information come through and uh, so much of it makes sense, it's also just so nice to see a bit of kinship and, and, and community of people supporting each other. So just want to say thanks to everyone watching in for providing that as well. Oh, thank you. We, we originally developed this. We have our watertight Wednesday. So first Wednesday of every month, we have a round table for marketers and someone described it as group counselling for misunderstood marketers. <laughs> Which I thought was fantastic. So if you want to come along to our group counselling for misunderstood marketers, it's on the first Wednesday of every month, which is tomorrow. And in fact, we're going to be talking about budgeting. Um, so let me um, end this and share that with you. So uh, it looks like you want to talk about uh, meaningless metrics. Um, buzzword bingo, relay race and cost budgeting can all be found on the blog post. So let's talk about meaningless metrics. What do I mean by meaningless metrics? So meaningless metrics. So I don't think you should be measuring anything that doesn't actually change a decision. So you should only really be measuring stuff if it informs a change of but something that you are going to do um, in, in, your, uh, in your activity. And the key thing that I would say about um, making sure that your metrics are meaningful is that I believe that marketers need to be ratio obsessed and a bit disinterested in volume. So if you were to picture the sales process, and no doubt many of you have as a sales funnel, and we can talk about that another time, but let's say you've got the steps in the process and you've got volumes of people at each stage, the volumes are almost inconsequential. What you're really looking for is the ratio between steps. How many people are moving from awareness into interest, from interest into evaluation, because that shows how good your marketing tools are at convincing and converting. And so ratios is where marketers test their metal rather than volume. 
Rachel, what do you what do you, what do you want to add on uh, metrics? I know I could write a whole another book on metrics. Yes, I mean, I, I remember talking to um, uh, an MD, a business that I was working with, and I was actually mentoring their marketing manager. Um, and uh, she came to me and she said, um, the my boss, so he was the MD, uh, part of his business plan, so this was at a strategic level, part of his business plan was to increase the website visitors to their website. Um, and we had a long conversation about it and, and talked about uh, the fact that actually that meant absolutely nothing at all because we weren't necessarily going to be the right clients. Um, so that was a prime example of a meaningless metric that the marketing department was fast with achieving. Um, so we reframed it um, and uh, we, we talked about how we actually might, as you say, talk about conversion rates, but understanding um, the different metrics that you need to put in place to indicate where people are in their buying journey. Yes. Um, and, and, and that's so important, isn't it? So having a, a KPI per step in the journey. So for those of you, so you do go and grab a free digital copy of the book. You go to watertightmarketing.com forward slash free book. Chapter 10 is all about metrics and choosing that um, kind of key performance indicator for each step in the journey. And then I've got the sort of time horizons and basically the kind of mistakes people make with, with metrics. And I would really encourage you to, to give that a flip through and then sit down, ideally with your, probably your head of your finance director, get them to read um, chapter 10. That's when the finance director leans in, particularly nine and 10, they sort of go, Oh, I get it now um, mm. and agree on what those KPIs are and mm. and that becomes your sort of bellwether metric and you yeah. should be targeted on um, increasing conversions I have a website story actually that says that talks to the same thing red spot storage so we put there uh, Cheryl and I put their new website live and I had a chat with George and he said Brian we've put the website live and it's awful <clears throat> but, oh my god what's happened he said it's absolutely awful. You have um, I, I've, you've halved the number of people that are inquiring each week. And I went, oh, gosh, awful. And I said, how many people have booked storage? He said, well, the same as always. I said, OK, so you've had half the number of conversations to achieve the same amount of sales. Yes. So you've saved a lot of time. Yes because marketing was filtering out the wrong side of the type of work. And so although the volumes had remained the same, the conversion rate had gone up and now he had double amount of time to go and find more of the right kind of work. This is what I mean by meaningless metrics. So if we'd said, you know, actually we've, we've doubled your number of inquiries, George, but you're still getting the same number of, of conversions. That's what I mean about a meaning, meaningless metric. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to move you on to the, the next set and I'm going to uh, put a poll up again. And I've seen the great question from, uh, from about reading the book from Carsten. I'll come to that in a moment. So if we come to the next poll, do vote on which of these you would like us to talk about. Would you like us to talk about not invented here, colouring in? perfectionism or stories versus stats which of these credibility killers would you like us to talk about how do you convince people to um read the book so how do you um it is a it is a seventy-five thousand word book so i understand that your chief exec might not read that on the train um i also understand that lots of people like audio books um now unfortunately if i just read this book out i'd be referring to a visual every three minutes um, so it doesn't work like that. There is, we do have a, uh, a pod blog where I've read out a few of the key uh, blog posts that are key kind of conversion tools for us, that conversing of acidic. So if you go to the blog on the watertight, um, watertightmarketing.com uh, forward slash blog, you'll find a link through to a pod blog um, where I just read out our best blog posts. Um, and sometimes that's a good way to get people um, starting into it. So do have a look. If you go to watertightmarketing.com forward slash free book, you can grab yourself um, a copy of the digital version. You will need to do that on your device. There's no PDF available. Something about a best-selling book. The publisher didn't want me to give, the, give away the PDF. Who knew? 
Um, okay, let's have a look at what. Oh, this is this is a closer one. This is a closer one. But just by a hair here, we've got stories versus stats. So if you want to look at not invented here, colouring in and perfectionism, go to the uh, blog post. The blog post is linked over there in chat. So what I would say about stories versus stats is that you tend to get marketers who talk in one or the other. So you tend to get marketers who are storytellers. So maybe they've gone and got the story brand book and they've decided that all marketing is narrative. Um, uh, or you've got those people who um, are utterly obsessed and say, well, the facts speak for themselves. Um, facts never speak for themselves and stories need evidencing. Yeah. So if you are, if you, the, I, used, I used to do um, competitive debates and it was one, it was part of our training that every time you use a metaphor, you also provide a statistic. Every time you provide a statistic, you also tell a story. And um, what you will tend to find is you, you as a marketer probably have a default setting. You're either a natural storyteller or you think that facts are your friend. You absolutely have to marry these things together. And if you talk all one or all the other, you are going to miss half of the room. Rachel, do you have any examples? Um, uh, I'm just thinking. Um, I think I, I think my example is, 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 is related, but slightly different. It's kind of talking to people who um, who believe that mark people make marketing decisions or decisions to buy only based on fact and logic yeah. um, and and I think that that links because it's it's never only fact logic or only emotion and you kind yeah. of think it's like b2b marketers who say b2b marketing is all about logic and rationale and people only make decisions based on that or price and it's not true no. Um, uh, and so you do need a balance, I think, um, yeah. in terms of, um, you know, so our marketing needs to balance that uh, appealing to people's emotion and appealing to people's logic and rationale. Yeah. And if you want to explore that more, if you have a look at chapter three in the book, we talk about the logic sandwich where you where you um, move people through emotion into logic and back. And also, if you have a look at um, leak number six, so we have the touch point leaks, leak number six is about um, proof, uh, having proof for every promise. And we always talk about balancing fact and feeling. Uh, because if you talk all in facts, there's someone there going, ah, oh, lies and statistics. And if you talk all in feeling, they go, that's their mates, isn't it? They'll say, they'll, of course, they're going to say it's great. So always balance these things out. Really, really important. OK, third poll for you folks. We have what would you like us to talk about next? Would you like us to talk about tactic burn? Shiny, shiny, stuck record or my precious? What do you want us to talk about? Oh, this is a close run one. We're within percentage points of each other here. Any other comments or questions whilst people are voting, Joe? I was uh, I was just appreciating the banter going on between uh, Nicole and Will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do we have a storyteller and a stat person? Do we have the, a, yeah, 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 yeah. classic. Well, classic. Well, We'd love well, you both. You're both important. <laughs> it, yeah. is, it feels like between Will and I, so Will is the uh, the stat person and, and, and I'm, I'm the storytelling person. So between us, I feel like we're a whole marketer, you know, so yeah. like. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, no, that's it, not funny. I spoke to Abigail Dixon yesterday. She's the, the her book is called The Whole Marketer. And we were, yeah. funnily enough, we were talking about, um, we were talking about the, you know, the skills that really take someone up into strategist. Mm -hmm. And this this balancing of empathy and evidence was something we were really talking about. We're, we're, uh, so um, good, good, good cue in there. Right. <laughs> let's uh, let's share these results with you. So if you want shiny, shiny, stuck record or my precious, head on over to the blog post. Um, what we have here is tactic burn. You want to know about tactic burn. So tactic burn, shiny, shiny, you probably recognize that's the, uh, you know, that's the kind of magpie marketer. Oh, look, new thing. Um, tactic burn is a slightly nuanced version of that. So tactic burn is when you try a thing, you try a marketing technique and it doesn't work. 
And so you go and do something else. Now, normally marketing techniques don't work for one of two reasons. Either they're not in sequence of a journey. So, you know, all arms, no legs, and you're trying to run. So if you've not done your legs, that doesn't work. So they're either not in the right sequence, you haven't got the balance, um, or because you haven't left them gestate for long enough. So the F3, you haven't done it for long enough to see a difference. So often what people do is they go, well, that hasn't worked because they haven't done it long enough or it's not been appropriately sequenced. And then they say, I don't know what they've done, PR. PR doesn't work categorically. Yeah, they cross it out. This shall never be done again. We tried that. It didn't work. And what you find is you go into organizations and you, you're putting a plan together and you, you outline the plan and they go, yeah, we've tried all that. It didn't work. Yeah. OK. And, you know, the, what you need to paint then is why it didn't work in that sequencing, in that journey, why it didn't work because of the time horizon. So tactic burn is slightly different from shiny, shiny. Shiny, shiny is just someone who's easily distracted by the new thing, novelty. Tactic burn is where you cross it out forever because it has been proven that it will never work, probably because you did it wrong. <laughs> what would you like to add, Rach? Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons, aren't there, why things don't work. And I think as well, we as marketers need to kind of examine that because, you know, things don't always work. It could be timing. It could be um, because um, it the, the messaging that you're putting out doesn't doesn't quite work, doesn't quite engage people. Um, and that's why it's worth kind of testing different things at, yeah. at, um, sometimes at different um, at different points. And there's, um, but there's a real difference, isn't there, between test and learn? and trash and burn yeah so test you if you're doing a test you have to test it properly so you have to test it within a journey and you have to give it long enough to actually have an effect and what i think is tricky particularly within digital is that people get a uh, over test and they don't let it just eight for long enough and they haven't planned it out and so it's almost like they prove a negative by doing it to, by stopping too soon or whatever so yeah. um, take care as to whether you're, are you really doing test and learn or are you doing tactic burn? So think about it. And when you're ruling, when you're saying that doesn't work, really interrogate why it didn't work. Because if it was a great idea and it hasn't worked, it probably needs tweaking, not ditching. Yeah, so um, have a think about this because test, test and learn can definitely turn into tactic burn. Yeah. Okay, last poll for you in terms of um, our 16 things that we see people do. Let's have a look. Oh, sorry, I was still sharing the last one, but I'm sure you could hear us. Would you like to know how quick wins, the external eye, time hor horizons, or knowledge versus know-how as undermining your credibility? Oh, mm -hmm. you know, I've got a different thing on screen, haven't I? I've got campaign mindset instead of time horizons, but they go together. Oh, yes. Campaign mindset and time horizons do go together. So it makes sense. Yeah. It certainly makes sense in my head. <laughs> <laughs> It'll make sense in yours soon. Um, any other questions or comments whilst people are voting, Joe? <laughs> Folks are just uh, uh, chatting through um, the, the the sort of turning off of, of tactics as as we go, and I, it's something that I've definitely related to um as a business owner as much as I'm a marketer. You know, I'll, I'll go to folks and sort of say, you know, I'd like to do a a Facebook campaign. You know, rather than asking a social expert, you know, uh, how would social media better fit into our activity? You yes. know, so even even with that knowledge, then I still do the crime. You know, so it's it's interesting, yeah. isn't it that um it's an easy trap to fall into and it is. I, think I love that, Evan's comment um the shared folders are littered with the debris of previous projects and plans. yes <laughs> it's yes so I it's think so we true. all recognize that but yeah. I think so, so much of this uh speaks through to you know taking you know I mean you you've said it in, in the presentation element as well today about taking folks on the journey yeah. um and, and sort of explaining uh why you're doing what you're doing and, yeah. and, and so on and so forth and i think that that journey element is is both important for us as marketers to grasp uh for folks 
uh, and also for, of course for the folks who um, are, are sort of working with marketers so yeah because then it, it helps to contextualize doesn't it what you're doing say this is this is where I'm doing this this is where I'm working this is where it's coming from and this is where I'm leading to yeah well, absolutely absolutely so that so that so your poll and I think it's what you're talking about is utterly relevant to what people have asked for so they've asked me to talk about quick wins which we'll do if you want to look at the external eye time horizons and campaign mindset um, and knowledge versus know-how, know -how, do go and have a look at um, the blog post. And the blog post for this is in the um, is in the chat area. So quick wins. Who doesn't love a quick win? Now, um, when you're in organisations where someone says, you know, let's just do that. Please, marketing, can you get us a few quick leads? I want you to resist. Um, and I, I will leave you with one last analogy on this because I know we've only got three minutes left. And that is that... Um, if you wish to get fit, you can't say I'll stop eating pies when I've lost weight. You have to stop eating pies and then you will more likely lose weight. So quick wins when you keep grabbing the bag of chips because it's there. That will stop you. It will weigh you down. It will slow you down. And so actually getting people to switch their mindset to a longer term, more strategic view using some of the techniques that we've talked about will stop you from constantly reaching for the bag of chips um, and get people into this long term mindset. So with three minutes left, I think that's everything that's, um, that I wanted to share specifically today. It's been fantastic to have Rachel with me. If you would like to um, see a bit more of what we're about, as I say, go to watertightmarketing.com forward slash test. Now in that, there's a link through to book a, a session with either Rachel or myself or one of the other um, practitioners here at Watertight. And if you want to run through your results with us and maybe, I don't know, role play how you're going to have the conversation with your MD, give us a shout. We'd love to talk to you about converting a cynic. And if you want to talk to us about setting marketing in this strategic context, do also talk to us about our new apprenticeship program. If you're looking to train your marketers to think more strategically, have a chat with Rachel, who runs our translate and training side of things. We've just launched a new uh, Watertap Marketing Informed Digital Marketer Level 3 apprenticeship. And we're really excited to get um, early, uh, early career marketers to start to think strategically. I think that's everything I wanted to say. Anything, any finishing comments from you, Rach? No, that I realised there are quite a few questions and we, we could have talked for all day really and answered those. So I'm, I'm sorry to those who asked the questions and we didn't get round to answering them. But um, yeah, it was, it was fun. Thank you very much for interacting. Thanks for all your comments. Lovely. Thank you so much. You know, I've been watching the questions as we've been going, obviously, and, and watch them in the Q&A. And I think a lot of the stuff that you ended up speaking about at the end as well and throughout the duration of the presentation um, captured a lot of the questions that were actually asked as well. So um, I'll make sure to send them through just in case, because it's a nice bit of inspiration for, for both of you as well. But um, mm -hmm. As uh, as Louise has just said uh, in in the in the chat feature down there, then it's been such a relatable session uh, on so many levels, and and I feel, you know, there was a real couple of light bulb moments there for me, you know, um, going throughout the duration, you know, and and I think that's what these sessions are about, you know, if it's one or two little things where you can sort of feel armed for that conversation next time. It's been an hour well invested in yourself. So thank you very much, Bryony and Rachel, for uh, illuminating a few minds. And, and uh, hopefully the chat feature is in the test right now to, uh, to you know, just how people have enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you, of course, to everyone watching in as well this morning. Um, it's such a joy to share every one of these sessions with you. Uh, and, you know, every week, it's just amazing. I saw Nicole mentioning earlier, uh, might even see a, a few of you in London tonight. Uh, if that's the case, we'll see you then. Uh, if it's not, we will see you uh, next Tuesday uh, for a webinar all about market research and specifically quantitative market research and getting it right. Uh, in the meantime, I'll see you very soon. Thank you very much, Bryony, Rachel, everyone watching, and also a big, big thank you to our sponsors today, Attest. Uh, please do share on social media your biggest takeaway from today's session.